living tanks of the dinosaur world. 66 million years ago, the late Cretaceous period played host to the amazing Ankylosaurus. The name literally means fused lizard in Greek because its skull and other bones were all stuck together, making it insanely solid. Although it was believed that these dinosaurs lived mainly in the western United States and Alberta, Canada, recently their fossils have been discovered in places as far as China. The only question is, how on earth did these short-legged, heavy dinosaurs get that far? Well, they weren't really that short. In fact, they were the largest in the Ankylosauridae family. At around 30 feet long, 6 feet wide, and 4 feet tall, they were the size of a school bus. On top of that, weighing over 4 tons meant this tank-sized dinosaur could crush the bones of an ancient crocodile relative. But let's get back to that later. Ankylosaurus are a member of the Thyreophora clade, which makes them a basic ornithischian dinosaur. This group included the famous Stegosaurus, with its plate-backed structure, as well as other early Thyreophorans like Skeletosaurus. Within the family Ankylosauridae, there are two subfamilies, Ankylosauridae and Nodosauridae. Ankylosaurus is categorized under Ankylosauridae, which is a subgroup known for its larger, heavily armored dinosaurs, often armed with impressive and lethal tail weapons. For a while now, there was only one known species of Ankylosaurus, called Ankylosaurus magniventris. It was first identified by American paleontologist Barnum Brown in 1908, and the name roughly translates to fused lizard with a great belly, which is of course a nod to its robust armor and substantial size. These guys were considered the largest Ankylosaurus, and their modern-day comparison would be with rhinos. In fact, an adult rhinoceros today would be less than half the weight and size of an Ankylosaurus magniventris. However, recently, scientists have identified a new Ankylosaur species called Vectipelta beretti, which inhabited England's Isle of Wight between 66 and 145 million years ago. This discovery is shaking things up because until now, everyone thought all the Ankylosaurs' bones on the island belonged to a dino named Polycanthus foxi. But the Vectipelta was heavily armored, with flat plates, round scoots, and big curvy spines. And on top of that, it was about 33 feet long. It also shockingly turned out that the Vectipelta is older than Polycanthus by about 6 to 8 million years and has some pretty unique features, like a different pelvic structure and armor with amazing scale depressions. What's even more amazing? is that Vectipelta seems to have some family ties with Ankylosaurus in China, which tells you that these dinosaurs might have globetrotted between Asia and Europe during their time. Now, the appearance of Ankylosaurus was like nothing you've ever seen before. It had a strong, barrel-shaped body and not too much leg length, giving it a compact and well-protected vibe. The skull was broad and kind of triangular, with two short horns on each side above the ears, and two smaller backward-pointing horns below. Its beak up front was tough and perfect for munching on vegetation, especially ferns and shrubs along riverbanks in North America's floodplains. These guys were pretty hefty herbivores with wide, flat bodies, kinda like Stegosaurus, but instead of plates on their back, Ankylosaurus had these big bony armor plates and spikes. If we look inside its mouth, Ankylosaurus had a set of unique teeth, these leaf-shaped teeth were compressed sideways, standing unusually tall for a herbivore, but still kinda small in size. It might sound a bit weird, but this unique design was actually pretty smart. You see, by arranging the teeth this way, Ankylosaurus could fit more of them into its mouth, and that meant it could feed more efficiently. But this isn't what really made Ankylosaurus and other Ankylosaurs stand out. And if you're wondering what did, then it was that stunning armor. Ankylosaurus was like a walking fortress, covered in tough plates called osteoderms. These armor plates weren't just on its back, they were on the face, head, including horns at the back, around the nostrils, and even on the eyelids. The neck had arc-shaped curves of bony lumps, and these plates continued down the back in neat rows, getting bigger towards the middle of the dinosaur. Some armor even protected the legs, but the underside was less shielded. As you move towards the tail, the armor got thinner, with smaller plates ending in a massive tail club. This was made of two big plates joined together, surrounded by smaller ones. 
One of these clubs was found measuring 60 centimeters long, 49 centimeters wide, and 19 centimeters tall, and the owner of that club probably wasn't fully grown, which means it might have been even bigger. This tail was seriously powerful, thanks to ossified tendons that provided extra strength. The dinosaur could swing this tail club from side to side, using it as a weapon against large predators. With its weight, size, and strong muscles, the club had the potential to break bones and cause serious injuries to any unlucky dinosaur on the receiving end of a swing. We'll talk more about how this tail was used as a powerful weapon of self-defense in a bit. For now, adding on to its defense, all the tough armor plates on Ankylosaurus were covered in a layer of keratin, the same stuff in human fingernails and rhinoceros horns. Now, as you can guess, with its impressive size and strong structure, Ankylosaurus didn't have many natural enemies. I mean, taking down such a big, armored herbivore would have required a lot of coordination and effort from any predator daring to challenge it. The thing is, where do you even attack this guy? There are even bones in its eyelids. The only way to find a vulnerable spot would be to flip an Ankylosaurus over and attack its underside. Yeah, good luck pulling that off. Now, here's another one of its rather strange features. Ankylosaurus had a clever way of staying cool in the Cretaceous period. A recent study shows that their winding nasal passages, often called biological vents, were like built-in air conditioning. They had noses that puzzled scientists since the 1970s. Some thought these nasal twists served various purposes, like helping them smell better or aiding in breathing. But none of these studies fully made sense until a recent study took place and discovered that the twists and turns in ankylosaur noses acted as efficient heat exchangers. This helped them release body heat and cool down. Interestingly, even though two ankylosaurs, Euoplocephalus and Panoplosaurus, lived in the same place at the same time, their noses were different. Euoplocephalus had a better cooling system, possibly because of its larger size. Bigger bodies take longer to cool down and warm up. However, in this case, lifestyle differences may also have been at play. For instance, Euoplocephalus might have been a fan of sunbathing in open areas or snacking on less nutritious plants that produced more body heat. Moving on, let's talk about how these guys used the clubs at the end of their tails. Ankylosaurs were truly extraordinary dinosaurs, possibly the most heavily armored creatures ever seen on Earth. As mentioned before, they had spikes on their shoulders, bony armor covering their heads, and some even had bony eyelids, making them quite odd-looking. But perhaps the most distinctive feature that set them apart from any animals today was their extraordinary tails. Now, these tails weren't your average tails. Some ankylosaurs had a unique tail club, where the armor from other parts of their bodies was shaped into two massive lumps fused to the last few tail vertebrae. It looked a bit like a hammer. When first discovered, people thought it might be some kind of weapon, and they weren't wrong. To figure out if this tail club was indeed used as a weapon, scientists compared ankylosaurs to animals alive today. They found that throughout the history of life, animals often evolved specialized structures specifically for combat. Think about the horns of rhinos, the antlers of deer, and the horns of antelope, all designed for fighting. This comparison suggests that the ankylosaur's tail club might have been a powerful weapon, making them even more fascinating and bizarre in the dinosaur world. Now, of course, they were no pushovers when it came to defending themselves. Their powerful muscles and reinforced bones turned their unique structures, like the tail club, into daunting weapons. Fossil evidence suggests that ankylosaurs had adaptations in their tails, including muscles extending down the tail which would have attached to the handle of the tail club. This tail club was made even more frightening with the addition of numerous bony rods, providing a lot of force when swung from side to side. Some scientists even calculated that it could deliver enough force to devastate a car. Yep, definitely a powerful weapon for self-defense against predators. But there's more to the story. Scientists are now exploring new questions while in theory ankylosaur tails could break the legs of predators, recent studies, including one from 2022, suggest that they might have used their tail clubs for more than just self-defense. There's evidence of injuries among ankylosaurs that point to fights between individuals. 
possibly for mates or leadership within their packs. Oh, and here's another interesting thing related to their clubs. You'll love this one, especially if you've seen Ghostbusters. Who hasn't? Back in 2016, a fascinating discovery in Montana's Judith River Formation revealed an ankylosaur that looked remarkably similar to the mythical Ghostbusters monster, Zool. The paleontologists were so amazed by the resemblance that they named the specimen Zool Cruyvastator, translating to destroyer of shins in Latin. This name playfully references the ankylosaur's long, club-like tail. Now, if you're wondering why ankylosaurs had such elaborate defense systems, well, the answer is simple. They needed it. These dinosaurs coexisted with some of the largest known tyrannosaurs. Ankylosaurs in particular faced the king of all meat-eating dinosaurs everywhere, the Tyrannosaurus rex. Given this, it shouldn't be surprising that it developed more advanced, or should I say, extreme defenses. The increased size of Ankylosaurus, surpassing that of its earlier relatives, is just one indicator of this evolutionary arms race. However, surviving encounters with the Tyrant King demanded more than just sheer size. Armored taxa like Ankylosaurs needed enhanced cranial protection, so Ankylosaurs took measures to avoid attacks on their heads because the head was a prime spot, and the most effective way to defeat an armored dinosaur was to penetrate or crush its skull. These dinos adapted by pivoting to keep their heads out of the Tyrannosaurus's reach while ensuring their tail clubs remained within striking distance. However, relying solely on pivoting wasn't foolproof. This led to the evolution of cranial armor, including bony eyelids, which became essential for ankylosaurs. As Tyrannosaurus became more lethal, ankylosaurs needed increasingly robust cranial defenses to survive in this ancient game of predator and prey. The replacement of Pinacosaurus, lacking pre-maxillary armor, with Cycania and Tarkia, which possessed it, serves as a perfect example. Surely, the later ankylosaurs boasted superior armor across their skulls, but the nostrils were an Achilles heel. Predators often try to suffocate prey by crushing or fusing its breathing passages. If the skull was the prime target of the body, the nostrils were the prime target of the skull. Cycania and Tarkia took the early step of adding armor, but in late Maastrichtian time, T. rex underwent some upgrades of its own. The teeth of T. rex became more robust than those of predecessors and more capable of penetrating armor. So now, premaxillary armor by itself could not prevent damage to the nostrils had they remained in front. As a result, they had to be moved back, out of harm's way. Since the front of Ankylosaurus's skull was low, it wasn't difficult for T-Rex's jaws to gape wide enough to grasp it. Hence, a backward shift meant improved safety. As even more protection, a kind of nose roof called the Lareal Capitugale was also added. These Capitugale were pretty robust in adults. They shielded the nostrils from the T-Rex's upper jaw, which would have struck from above. Coming to the discovery of this amazing creature, it was back in 1906 when the renowned American paleontologist Barnum Brown kickstarted an expedition that eventually led to the exciting discovery of Ankylosaurus. Already famous for uncovering the first specimens of Tyrannosaurus rex, Brown embarked on this expedition in the Hell Creek Formation near Gilbert Creek in Montana, USA. With funding from the American Museum of Natural History, the team unearthed a treasure trove of bones, including the upper skull, two teeth, ribs, part of the shoulder, and over 30 individual osteoderms forming the dinosaur's distinctive back armor. Brown officially introduced this individual to the world, giving it the name Ankylosaurus through reports and papers based on the expedition. Fast forward to 1910, and Brown led yet another successful expedition to the Scholar Formation near the Red Deer River in Alberta, Canada. This time, the team made a groundbreaking discovery. A remarkable tale, complete with an attached club. This finding revolutionized our understanding of Ankylosaurus and its close relatives. The expedition also uncovered a complete skull, previously undiscovered ribs, vertebrae, and bones from both forelimbs and hindlimbs. However, this was the extent of our knowledge about Ankylosaurus until 1947, when American fossil hunters Charles M. Sternberg and T. Potter Chamney made further discoveries. They unearthed another complete skull, along with an additional lower jawbone. But interestingly, this time the skull was larger than the previous one, which meant that Barnum's dinosaurs may not have been fully grown. 
moving on to the place that these living tanks called home. Well, Ankylosaurus was one of the many iconic dinosaur species native to the Hell Creek Formation during the final stage of the late Cretaceous, just before the mass extinction event. Ankylosaurus fossils are mostly discovered in Montana, and some have been found in Wyoming, extending up into Canada, particularly in parts of Alberta and Saskatchewan. Scientists think Ankylosaurus might have been rare and possibly roamed alone because there aren't many fossils of it. Another reason for the scarcity could be that it liked to live in high places, like hills or mountains within the Hell Creek Formation. This choice of habitat might have made it harder for its remains to become fossils because there was less sediment covering them after it died, but Ankylosaurus might not have stuck only to high areas. The Hell Creek Formation had various environments, like ridge woodlands, rocky places, coastal lowlands, cliffs, marshes, and floodplains. Fossils found in sandstones and mudstones from these regions give us clues about the ancient surroundings. The weather was warm, it rained often, and the climate was subtropical, causing natural disasters like forest fires. As for the plants in Ankylosaurus's home, they were diverse, with early flowering plants, meadows in rolling highlands, tall conifer forests, low ferns, and cycads on the ground. There were also streams and rivers cutting through the land, flowing into the western interior seaway, Ankylosaurus lived alongside other famous dinosaurs in its habitat. Pachycephalosaurus roamed on mountainsides and hilltops, while large herds of Triceratops and Taurosaurus grazed in the floodplains. The formidable predator Tyrannosaurus rex also shared the environment and was one of the few dinosaurs capable of taking on an adult Ankylosaurus and winning. Different types of theropods were also around, like Ornithomimosaurus and Struthiomimus. In other parts of the Hell Creek region, the large Dromaeosaur, Dakota Raptor, thrived as well, creating a diverse landscape filled with truly amazing, awe-inspiring creatures. Since the Ankylosaurus wasn't particularly tall, with an inflexible neck and short stature, it would have exploited food sources close to the ground. In the higher altitudes of Hell Creek, it encountered little competition for abundant food sources growing alongside mountainsides and hill crests. Cycads and ferns would have been favorite meals for these bulky herbivores. Equipped with tough beaks and leaf-shaped teeth for stripping vegetation, while Ankylosaurus filled a similar ecological niche to modern-day giant herbivores in grasslands and plains, its lifestyle was pretty different. Unlike modern elephants that are ecosystem engineers, altering the land around them, Ankylosaurus did not possess the ability to knock over trees due to its low center of gravity. Its diet primarily consisted of soft plant matter, as its tiny teeth and beak structures were not suited for consuming rough bark. They probably ate low-lying plants. Its triangular-shaped skull, wider than it was long, featured a narrow beak at the end that helped it strip leaves from plants. Despite having small leaf-shaped teeth that weren't suited for breaking up large plants and lacking grinding teeth, Ankylosaurus managed to consume massive amounts of unchewed plants. An analysis from 2004 by Carpenter proposed that the broadness in part of Ankylosaurus's ribcage indicated the presence of a fermentation digestive system. This system would have aided in breaking down the tough, unchewed plants the dinosaur consumed. Also, about the complex nasal passage and large cavity volume they had in the olfactory region of their skull, a 2011 study in the Journal of Anatomy suggested that the looping nasal cavity didn't really enhance their sense of smell but that large olfactory bulb did. So these guys did have a strong sense of smell. This would have helped these dinosaurs find food and avoid predators in its environment. And as I mentioned before, Ankylosaurus did have predators, with Tyrannosaurus likely being the only dinosaur in Hell Creek capable of taking it down. Fights between these two species could have been lengthy and strategic, with each dinosaur having to time its attacks perfectly. The evolution of Ankylosaurus can be understood through two possible pathways. In one scenario, the handle evolved first, featuring overlapping tail osteoderms. The other path involves the simultaneous evolution of both the handle and knob, leading to a wide variation in their sizes. Given that by the early Cretaceous period, Ankylosaurus was developing flexible tails with vertebrae that locked together, it seemed that the second theory, suggesting the evolution of both structures at the same time, was accurate. 
Kazankylosaurus with knob tails began to appear towards the end of the Cretaceous period. Like other Thyreophora dinosaurs, these guys originated from small ornithischians that shared Jurassic floodplains with small theropod predators. As these predators grew larger and stronger, Thyreophorans needed to adapt for protection, and so some evolved into Stegosaurus, characterized by plates on their backs and spikes on their tails. Others, like Ankylosaurus, took a defensive approach. The skin on Ankylosaurus's back ossified into hardened bone and keratin, forming an almost impenetrable defense against the challenges posed by nature's most formidable weapons. This evolutionary adaptation allowed Ankylosaurus to thrive and survive in the changing landscape of the prehistoric world. As if their defense wasn't already strong enough, some Ankylosaurs took it a step further by going on the offensive with their tail clubs. This made them exceptionally challenging targets for even the most well-equipped theropods. Even though there's no dinosaur exactly like this one today, similar types of animals existed in the past. Back when our early ancestors were roaming around, there were ancient relatives of modern armadillos called glyptodonts. These big mammals had short legs, long tails with spikes or clubs, and large bodies covered in protective shells. They lived in South America, in places like Brazil and Argentina, during the time of saber-toothed cats and terror birds. Glyptodonts are a bit like the ankylosaurs we're talking about. They both had ways to defend themselves, and their bodies look kind of similar. This is an example of something called convergent evolution, where different groups of animals develop similar features to deal with similar challenges. It's like how today pangolins and anteaters are similar, or how modern whales and dolphins share traits with some ancient sea creatures from the time of dinosaurs. Nature just has a way of figuring out similar answers to challenges for different animals over a long, long time. But just like other dinosaurs in the late Cretaceous period, Ankylosaurus faced a catastrophic event that marked the end of the Mesozoic era, the Chicxulub asteroid impact. This devastating impact happened around 66 million years ago and brought fiery ash and doom for all non-ovarian dinosaurs on Earth. The aftermath was terrible. Thick clouds of ash darkened the sky, meteors fell like rain, and smoke filled the atmosphere, causing widespread destruction. Although anything close to the asteroid felt the immediate impact, the extinction event took about a year to wipe out the remaining victims, leading to a slow and painful end for many species. Ankylosaurus and other dinosaurs faced a pretty tough time after the Chicxulub asteroid impact. The plants they ate were either burnt or covered in ash, making it hard for them to find food. As herbivores, Ankylosaurus were among the first dinosaurs to be affected. As these plant eaters died out, the larger meat eaters also struggled to find food, causing a ripple effect of extinction. Then, by the end of the Cretaceous extinction event, almost three quarters of all living things on Earth and every other non-avian dinosaur were wiped out. This mass extinction also included sea reptiles like mosasaurs and plesiosaurs, as well as some amazing flying reptiles. All in all, the Chicxulub impact left a lasting mark on Earth's history, shaping the future of surviving life forms. With the disappearance of dinosaurs and other ancient giants, pterosaurs were replaced by a new group of creatures, mammals. The Cenozoic era saw the rise of mammals, small beings that used to live in the shadows of the extinct giants. As the ash settled and the plants grew back, a diverse range of mammals emerged to fill the empty spots left by the vanished giants. These new creatures crawled, fluttered, swung, and ran across the forests and plains, creating a world very different from the one where the giants once roamed. In this way, the Cenozoic era became a crucial time for the evolution and variety of mammals. In fact, it laid the groundwork for the rich and diverse ecosystems we see today. In the end, this plant-eating tank of a dinosaur, Ankylosaurus, was among the last dinosaurs to roam the Earth. And we know for a fact that if a T-Rex was ever hungry, this guy was never an easy meal. It probably couldn't move any faster than you and me can walk, which is around three miles an hour, but that didn't matter, because this dinosaur had better protection than a knight's armor. And that's a wrap. What do you think was more crucial for Ankylosaurus? Its armored body for protection, or its club tail for defense against predators? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoy learning about ancient creatures, make sure to hit that subscribe button 
and stay tuned for more cool stuff about the past.